the first part of this presentation, you became aware of some of the jargon that is used when working with students from other countries. You also realized the difference between language arts and English as a second language. Now it's time to learn about the challenges faced by English language learners when they are enrolled in a language arts reading class for adults or for children at the beginning, intermediate, or advanced proficiency level. In other lectures I've given, you've learned about some of the key players in second language acquisition. Two of these important contributors are pictured here, Jim Cummins and Anna Olshimo, who collaborates with J. Michael O'Malley. After much research, Shimo and O'Malley determined that the CALP used in language arts classes is more complex than the CALP used in science, math, and social studies. This is because of the various types and functions of language needed to read and write. You also already know that, as a teacher, no matter what your content area, you need to be focused on teaching academic English, or CALP. Probably the most important difference between BIX and CALP for a classroom teacher to realize is that it takes an ELL about two years to acquire BIX, but it takes that same ELL between five and ten years to acquire enough CALP to function like a native English speaker in a classroom. The implication of this is staggering. If a student comes to the U.S. in eighth grade or about 13 years old, it will take until 10th grade to master his social English, and his freshman year at college at best to master CALP. So let's talk about why reading is so difficult for English language learners. Actually, research has demonstrated that readers use the same processes in both first and second language reading. Even so, some second language readers find reading in the L2 difficult. Why? What? The differences that language learners frequently encounter when they are reading a foreign language text fall into three general areas. Culture and concepts, vocabulary, and language functions and structures. And every single text that students read in a K-12 through or college level language arts class is full of culture a culture that is foreign to them. Writers assume that readers know about the social settings and the people in their texts and share their values and traditions. English language learners don't. David Ausubel in the 1960s taught us about the importance of making learning meaningful by activating prior knowledge. If readers have grown up with similar kinds of stories, they will know what to expect while reading. In contrast, a reader who has grown up with stories from a different culture may find the whole premise of the story incomprehensible. And note that this has nothing to do with vocabulary or mechanics. Let's think about our American author, Laura Ingalls Wilder, who grew up on the prairie whose family got to the prairie by riding in a Conestoga wagon. In your language arts class, you might have a testing requirement. Write a three-paragraph essay using the following prompt. If you were going out west in a Conestoga wagon, what would your life be like? This question is ambiguous because it is biased. What is meant by west? West of what? West of Fort Lauderdale, Florida? That would be the Gulf Coast of Florida. West of Los Angeles, California? That would be the Pacific Ocean. What's a Conestoga wagon? Unless the students had studied covered wagons or knew that out west implied the unsettled American western terrain the pioneers explored, they wouldn't be able to answer that question. Is this a fair assessment of the students' knowledge? If you have ELLs who have no shared background knowledge or experience, the teacher will need to provide it. This can be done as in or out of class work.
The most obvious place we see culture is in the details of the story itself. The character's personality and where he is, the setting, are culturally charged, as are the plot, conflict. The heroes in Western, European, and American stories are assertive and goal-oriented. When the hero successfully overcomes the obstacles, there is normally a material reward given to him, like a pot of gold or marriage. In contrast, in Asian stories, the main character's adventures are brought about through chance or fate, rather than through active pursuit of a tangible goal. Rewards result from the protagonist's kindness and goodness, rather than through personal desires or goals. The respect of others is more important than any material advantage in stories from Asian cultures. A Japanese English language learner, then, will not personally connect with or easily understand the story from America. These different patterns reflect cultural values and belief systems. Words themselves present problems for ESL students. For example, a lot of culturally driven symbolism occurs in poetry. Some words familiar to ESL students can be used in a novel way. Some words are used colloquially. Other words have specific cultural and literary reference, and still other words can be used metamor metaphorically. There are many words which have fallen into disuse in contemporary English. Teachers need to be aware of the vocabulary demands of all kinds of authentic text and show their students how to comprehend and enjoy what they read. Think of how difficult it is for native English-speaking students to read a work by William Shakespeare. Then reflect on how overwhelming it must be for an ELL. A solution for this is to teach language learners learning strategies. ESL students must learn appropriate strategies to address the array of unfamiliar vocabulary found in literature and other authentic texts. Without any training in learning strategy usage, ESL students will resort to looking up every single word they do not understand. Take the phrase rush hour traffic. Native English speakers know that this phrase refers to more than one time of the day, more than one hour during each of those times of the day, and all of the headaches that come along with it. An ESL student may look up the word rush, then look up the word hour, and then look up the word traffic, and he may or may not eventually figure out all that we mean by it. In 1957, Robert Lotto proposed the contrastive analysis hypothesis, which finds educational value in comparing and contrasting the native language and the target language, because the main idea of the hypothesis is that native language rules will either help or hinder the learning of the second language. The contrastive analysis hypothesis attempts to find similarities and differences in the rules of two different languages. For example, morphology, semantics, and pragmatics in the two languages might be compared and contrasted. The main concept of this hypothesis is interference, which means how the first language and the second language interact. The interactions are called positive transfer, which focuses on the similarities and how those similarities help a person learn another language, and negative transfer, which focuses on the differences and how those differences hinder a person from mastering another language. Robert Lotto tells us to teach our students to take advantage of positive transfer. For ELLs with a strong academic language in their native language or a culture experience similar to ours, it is just a matter of finding a label for a concept that is already well understood. Look for cognates and be aware of false cognates. 
Cognates are words that are related in form and meaning to ones in another language, like the English word music and the German word Musik. According to Lotto, a language learner will be successful at mastering the target language if the native language is closer to the target language. If she receives individualized and personalized practice, if she receives enough practice so that new habits are formed, and if she receives positive reinforcement for grammatical performance to overcome interference. Teachers should also be aware of differences in orthographic systems. Writing systems vary greatly in terms of the symbols they utilize. Not all languages are written with an alphabet, and not all alphabets look like the ones we use or are even written in the same direction that we write and read. Chinese, for example, does not use an alphabet. It uses a logographic system in which each character represents a morpheme. Japanese is a syllabic language, which means each symbol represents a syllable used in composing words, whereas English uses letters to compose mono or polysyllabic words. English, Hebrew, Arabic, and Russian all use an alphabet, but not the same one. And Arabic is read from right to left, whereas English, Russian, and Korean are read from left to right. Hebrew requires that only consonants be written down. And to read Hebrew, readers must fill in the vowels by inferring the overall context of the sentence. Our language, English, not only uses an alphabet, but we also rely on our pronunciation. English is a graphophonic language. We use phonetic cues in addition to context to distinguish between nouns and verbs, compound words, and adjective noun phrases, and homonyms. For example, English speakers use stress placement to distinguish between a noun and a verb in words like conduct and conduct, and permit, permit and between compound nouns and adjective noun phrases like blackboard, blackboard, and greenhouse, greenhouse. Although these words appear to be the same or similar in spelling, their distinct pronunciations result in different meanings. Homonyms are words that have the same or similar spelling and pronunciation, but different meanings, like the word pool in pool table, and swimming pool. All of these writing differences mentioned above will most likely have some effect on reading speed, word recognition, and comprehension, especially for beginning readers of English. To be fluent readers of English, readers must be able to recognize letters and words and must possess the eye motor coordination necessary for rapid reading. ELLs with writing systems different from the one we use in English may not be able to do rapid reading as well as other ELLs. Teachers should not see this as a sign that warrants ESE intervention. Culture is hiding everywhere. Not only does it show up in the details of the story and in words, it also shows up in organizational patterns. Students from other countries need to be taught what is expected in writing in order to be able to read effectively. They need to know to look for that magic number three. Three events in a narration, or three examples or steps in expository text, for example. In some cultures, written text presents truth Knowing this helps explain why some ELLs do not challenge or reinterpret a text in light of other texts. The functions of literary text are more varied than for any other content area. The functions include describing, defining, narrating, persuading, entertaining, and teaching values. Functions structures, vocabulary, and cultural concepts are interwoven in literary text to form a complete message 
in which the author speaks in a highly personal way, and the reader comprehends in an equally personal way. Language arts teachers need to be sensitive to the impact of culture on their students' ability to comprehend literature and to express their ideas comprehensively. Lotto suggests that we ask students to share stories from their own cultures, analyze the structure, and make comparisons with the structure of stories read in English. Teachers should always provide direct teaching of story grammar to increase students' comprehension. Students can answer a series of questions about the structure of a story, or they can complete a story map, which identifies the story's main features and sequence of events. Should teachers simplify literature and other authentic texts for ELLs? By the intermediate level, teachers should start using only authentic texts. Teachers can help students understand by providing necessary background knowledge and by showing them how to use learning strategies that assist comprehension. In the K-12 system, standards like the English Language Proficiency Standards, part of the Sunshine State Standards in Florida, allow teachers to vary the task requirements according to each ELL's knowledge and proficiency level. Some students might make lists related to the story, others might read it cooperatively, and others might read it independently. Some students might write a group summary of a story, while others might retell it to the teacher, aide, or classmates. In sum, there are many reasons why reading in English is difficult for English language learners. But it's not so bad. Most ELLs tend to be quite motivated to learn English. They desire to learn English to get a good education, a more interesting job, a better salary, social recognition, and a desire to integrate into the new country.